Thank you, everyone, for joining us here at the Catholic Information Center this evening. As you know, um, we are here for an, an event that's very unique and remarkable. Uh, we have His Eminence Donald Cardinal World here today, returning from Rome to discuss his experience at the Synod on the new evangelization in Rome. As, and please join us afterwards for a reception. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Cardinal Donald World. He was elevated to the College of Cardinals in 2010 by Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, Cardinal World serves on numerous national and international bodies, including the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Congregation for the Clergy. Pope Benedict XVI appointed Cardinal World as the Realtor General of the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization for the Transmission of the Christian Faith, which was held just this, past, this month in the Vatican. He is known nationally for his catechetical teaching and ministry and for his efforts on behalf of Catholic education. Cardinal World is chairman of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Doctrine and a member of the USCCB Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis and the Ad Hoc Committee, Committee for Religious Liberty. Cardinal World is the author of numerous articles and numerous books. We're happy to have here as well at the Catholic Information Center. You can find it afterwards in our bookshelves including best-selling catechisms such as The Teaching of Christ and The Catholic Way. His books include The Mass and The Gift of Blessed John Paul II, and most recently, Seek First the Kingdom. Cardinal World hosted Pope Benedict XVI in Washington in April 2008. As many of you may remember, the Holy Father's historic journey to the United States. And among all these accomplishments, Cardinal World is also the recipient of the first annual Blessed John Paul II Award for the New Evangelization that the Catholic Information Center awarded in June of this year. So we're very happy to welcome back Cardinal World. Please join me in welcoming His Eminence Cardinal, Cardinal Donald World. Thank you very much. This is, a, this is a, a typical Catholic gathering, so you who are standing back here, there are seats <laughs> in the very front row. And I can assure you that you should feel free to take them because there's no collection. <laughs> well, Panama, thank you. Thank you for your very gracious invitation to be here uh, to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the, the new evangelization and the synod that just ended. So I am very, very grateful to have the opportunity once again to be back here at the Catholic Information Center and to have this opportunity to have a little bit of time with all of you. As you know, the synod just ended. It ended last Sunday with uh, an extraordinary mass that our Lord God celebrated at St. Peter's Basilica. And uh, for me, it was a very special moment because I had the privilege of being able to celebrate at the altar with the Pope, uh, something that you don't take lightly <laughs> when you have an opportunity to do uh, something as, as special as that. But it all began a month before. I think you're all aware that a synod, uh, the whole idea of a synod grew up out of the Second Vatican Council. As the council was ending, Pope Paul VI thought, wouldn't it be good to try to continue this experience, this collegial experience? Uh, well, you have to find a way to do it in a much more simple manner. You can't be bringing uh, 4,000 bishops together uh, with any regularity. So the idea of the synod, that is bringing together about 200 to 250 bishops who are reflective of the church throughout the whole world. And every once in a while, every three years or so, I bring them together to talk about some specific theme. And this synod had as its theme the new evangelization. I, I was greatly, greatly privileged to be a part of this gathering, 250 bishops and about 50 experts and auditors, lay men, lay women, religious, who formed a part of this body. I was asked as it ended, 
what was your what was your experience of it? What was your experience of those uh, those full three weeks of, of meeting? My first thought was to say fatigue, but <laughs> but to give a more serious answer, the the adjectives that came to mind when I tried right off the top of my head, while it was still fresh, while the experience was still fresh, to say, what, how would you describe how you felt as you went through these three weeks? And three, three words came to mind. The first was, it was a very positive experience. Now, you may, you may find that a little bit odd because the question we were dealing with was certainly not a happy one. Uh, the whole question of the need for a new evangelization. But I found there was this sense among the participants in the Synod that we really were experiencing a new moment in the church. There was a sense of a new, a new Pentecost. And you could hear people talking about that from all over church all over this, this planet. All those bishops who came were saying, we have, we have real problems, there are serious issues, but there's also a sense of a new purpose in the church, a sense that we're going in the right direction. We have a lot ahead of us, and we have a lot of hurdles and barriers we have to get over, but we're going in the right direction. And one of the things that made me reflect on that, on the positive nature of it, was the number of young people, the number of young adults, who, while they were not a part of the synod, were certainly a part of the Roman experience during the days of the synod. There were groups of young people from college programs, from Focus, from uh, campus ministries, from organizations, universities, that work with the whole idea of bringing people back to the practice of the faith. I found that was probably the most encouraging aspect of it, was to come out of the Synod Hall and see so many young people who were just interested in passing on the faith, just interested in appreciating, loving, embracing, and living the faith. The second word that I would use to describe my experience of this was united. There was a sense of, of unity in, in that aula, in that hall. There was the recognition that we have, we have problems, uh, but there was also a, a unity in recognizing and identifying what the problems are. That's already a big start. You can't begin to fix something if you don't recognize that it's broken and where it's broken. And that was one of the encouraging things, the unity uh, among the bishops in the Synod Hall that we, we do have problems, but we also have a lot of very, very good things going on. Now, you might say to yourself, well, you should have been united. You're all bishops. Uh, and there's a sense in which that's true. You only had to be in that synod for a day, two days at most, and realize all of the bishops there shared the same faith, shared the same vision of what needs to be done. The, uh, the challenges were how pastorally to, to do this and to do it well. I found that a sign of this new Pentecost that we're talking about, this presence of the Spirit. When you think that the charisma we're talking about was announced 2,000 years ago, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that the bishops who were there came from all over the world, that as soon as we got into that room, we realized we all shared the exact same faith. And that says to me, the Spirit continues to work in the church. The Spirit continues to be present in the church. There's no other institution that could make that claim, that it is in living continuity, proclaiming the same faith, 
throughout the entire world, 2,000 years after the event. Uh, one of the things that I often reflect on, the previous synod, the synod for the word, uh, we were all given facsimiles of the papyrus that had the prologue of John and the Lucan account of the Our Father. Now, depending on how good your uh, ancient uh, Koine Greek is, uh, if you read that, and these are, these are facsimiles of uh, papyruses of the uh, third century. So we're talking about things that were done in the second century. Read them. And then read the New American Bible, and you're reading the exact same words. Uh, all of this just by way of saying the Spirit, the Spirit guides the church. And that was one of the things that I found a very uniting element. This sense that we, we know who we are as church. We're united around the message. We have a clear understanding of <coughs> what God calls us to be and do. And so in that unity, we can begin to talk about what, what are the pastoral, practical steps we need to take. And that's the third <coughs> word I would use to describe my experience of that synod. It was positive, it was united, and it was pastoral. It was very, very practical in its orientation. We were there to talk about how do you renew the face of the earth? How do you renew the faith of the church? How do you renew the energy that is to proclaim to people all over again, Jesus Christ is Lord? And invite people into that experience of him, that personal experience of him, that encounter with him. This was not a synod on theory. This was not a synod on theological niceties. It was a synod on how do we carry out the call to share the good news with everyone today. In contrast with, again, the synod on the word, the last, the previous synod, at that synod there were 60, 60, 60 bishops who were graduates of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, which meant they had all these letters after their name, uh, that they had studied scripture for years and years and years. And so no wonder a lot of the discussion was, uh, was very theoretical. This synod was very different. This has to do with how do we go about doing our work the work of proclaiming the gospel and bringing people to Christ. What, what was the task? What was the task of the new evangelization? What was the task of the synod? What did it accomplish? Well, I think one of the things that it made very clear was given the situation in which we live, the task of the church today, and that means the task of each one of us, is to get back to that basic curriculum. When we, were, when we were trying to put together statements, they're called propositions, at the end of, of the work of the Synod, what you're supposed to come up with are a number of statements that everybody can agree to. That's the fruit of our work, and then we give them to the Pope so that he can do a, an exhortation, uh, an apostolic exhortation. Well, one of the things that we spoke about and decided upon very early in the discussions was we have to get back to an understanding that what is missing in so much of the life of the church today and especially among all those people who should be with us and aren't is the clear basic story of our faith. That God so loved us that he sent his own word, who became one of us, who died for us, rose from the dead, sent the Spirit, and continues to be with us in his church, the basic charisma. 
We find it in the letter to the Corinthians. I passed on to you what I also received, that the night before he died, Jesus took the bread and took the cup. And then in the same letter, Paul says, Jesus died, was buried, rose, appeared to Peter and to the 12, and to about 500 others. That's the basic message, the charisma. And the Synod kept saying over and over again, we, we have to get back to inviting people into that experience, that encounter with Christ. Before we start to tell them how they, how we, how all of us should live our lives, before we begin to talk about how we're going to encounter all the major problems, social, moral, uh, that are a part of our society, we can only do that if we have encountered Christ, embraced the, the risen Lord, and find that he is with us in our lives. And that brings us to the question of the new evangelization itself. In, in what does it consist? We, we decided very early on we weren't going to try to define it, because that would be one way in which we could have spent the entire three weeks <laughs> in this theoretical world. Uh, so we said, why don't we just talk about describing it? Why don't we talk about, what would you say are the elements that make up the new evangelization? And I think we settled upon three, uh, and one of the ways you know that you have probably hit on the right idea is when the Pope begins his homily by saying, these are three of the elements of the new evangelization. <laughs> You have to say to yourself, I think that's right. <laughs> the first element is recognizing uh, the need, our own need, for the renewal of our own personal faith. You can't participate in sharing something if it hasn't been <coughs> renewed and alive in your own heart. The old axiom you can't give something you don't have. And so the first element of the new evangelization is to stir up in the heart of each one of us our, our awareness of the importance of the faith, deepen the faith through prayer, and come to a better appreciation of it through our own study, our own our reading of scripture, our own prayerful reading of scripture. Personal <coughs> renewal is at the heart of whatever is going to happen in the new evangelization. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that each one of us make space in our day, make space in our life for prayer. Because that's how we talk and hear. That's how we speak and learn of the presence of God in our lives. But with, with this deepening of our faith, with this renewal of our faith, comes something that perhaps has been missing for a while in the church, in the lives of, of many Catholics. And that is a confidence, a confidence in the truth of the message. I think for so long, there was, there was a certain hesitancy among so many, and this grows up out of, out of, I believe, the confusion in the 1970s and 1980s and going into the 90s of what exactly, what exactly is our faith? And what does our faith call us to do and to be? I, I think back to those, those periods of, of catechetical confusion that dominated uh, two decades and created a generation that's essentially distanced from the church. Not because they want to be distanced from the church, they simply don't know. They don't know. I, I tell the story of, I, I got on a, a plane, I was going to a, a bishop's meeting, I got on a plane and took my seat and the man in the seat next to me said, hi father, where are you going? I thought, 
hope the same place you're going. <laughs> At least short term. <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, I, no, I meant why? Why are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to this meeting. It's a bishop's meeting. And, I, and uh, then I thought, well, politely I'll ask him, and why are you going? To Atlanta, and he said, okay, very much in this tone, I'm going to a First Communion. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say, I'm sure it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, well, that's a very happy event. <laughs> And he said, maybe for you. <laughs> so I realized this conversation can't go anywhere but up. <laughs> so I said, well, and he said, oh, he said, uh, I'm just in a bad mood. <laughs> really? <laughs> he said, I'm going because it's my kid brother's first kid. And besides that, my mother called last week and said, I want to see you there. <laughs> so he said, that's why I'm going. I said, well, let's, let's talk about this. He said, I am, uh, I don't know what there is to talk about. He said, I, I went to uh, religious education when I was a kid. At least I went to some classes. And I thought, yeah, some few. <laughs> So we started the talk, and this time he was interested. Maybe it was because there we were, and we had two hours of flight. Uh, but he started raising questions about what is communion, and it gave us a chance to talk about Eucharist, Mass, communion, <laughs> none of which he had the foggiest idea of what that was all about, even though he was quite sure that he was a Catholic who knew this and had decided just to walk away from it. As we landed, he said, Father, thanks for talking to me about this communion thing. It's really cool. <laughs> and then he stopped and he said, I mean, great. <laughs> We have all around us people who simply don't know the faith, think they do. And because of that, the confusion that, that is generated, and because of the hesitancy that that has created, there's a lack of confidence in the truth of what we believe. And I think that's one of the things that the new evangelization is all about overcoming that hesitancy. There's something wonderful about standing in the truth, of simply knowing these are the words of everlasting life. This is true. This is what you give your life to. These are the principles and goals. These are the teachings. This is the reality that guides your life. You know, when you ask yourself, how shall I live? And every person Every person asks that question. Hopefully, you ask it when you're young. How shall, I, how shall I live? What are the values that are going to direct my life? What's the purpose of all this? What am I going to do with my life? And I don't mean just in terms of getting a job. What are the realities that are going to form and mold and guide my life? And you have to be certain that the answers you get are real. When, uh, when Jesus taught and some of the things he said became a little bit too much for some of the people and they walked away, he said to Peter, are you going to walk away as well? And Peter answered for all of us. He answered for the church today, the new mood in the church today. Where would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Where would we go? And so it is today. In the new evangelization, it's not just that we, we renew our own faith. We renew the confidence. We renew our own confidence 
<laughs> that this is true. And there's nothing as reassuring as knowing you stand in the truth. You stand in the truth. And we can afford to be confident, not arrogant, but confident. And we can afford then to face many, many issues around us. Sometimes with that serene calm that simply comes from knowing you're right. And the third element in this new evangelization is the willingness to share it. That's probably where we are the shyest, where we Catholics tend to be um, very reluctant evangelists. We tend to, to, be, uh, to be quiet. And there's so many opportunities when we have a chance to say in a conversation, in a discussion, uh, you know, I have a different opinion. I have a different take on that. And just be able to share our faith, our vision, what Jesus offers us, what the gospel says. I was, uh, now this was a number of years ago, I went up to the, to the ticket counter at, at the airport. <clears throat> Almost all of my stories, by the way, have to do with airports. <laughs> and one of the reasons for that is that's about the only place I ever get to be all by myself. <laughs> Everywhere else, there, there's all uh, there's events going on, and there are people helping you through them. And even at mass, I have a priest who assists me. At the airport, I'm just they're walking around in my collar and all kinds of people. By the way, if you really want to be an evangelist, go to the airport with a Roman collar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a great big magnet. <laughs> and you know the conversation goes something like this. Uh, Hi, Father. You're a priest, right? <laughs> yep. You know, I'm supposed to be Catholic. And I always respond, no, you are, you are. You're probably just not going to Mass. Or when you say to someone, uh, what parish do you belong to? And you get the answer back, my mother belongs to St. Barbara's. <laughs> Which means I haven't been to church for years. Uh, but they're great conversations because that's the beginning many times. But standing at, a, at, at an airport, I went up to the, to, uh, check at the, uh, at the counter to see whether or not my boarding pass was in order. I just do that because you get that little printout and uh, I'm always uh, hesitant that when I go to the gate they're going to say, what's that piece of paper? Mm -hmm. uh, so I always check. But anyway, there was, a, there was a young man behind the counter and he was clearly just an apprentice. He was just learning because there was a supervisor alongside of him and she was saying to him, now push that button and now look at that. And anyway, he said to me, yes, you're, uh, you're all right. So I went and I sat down and there was nobody else in the line. He came over and he said to me, were you born again? <laughs> and I said, yes. And I thought to myself, would any of us have the courage to start a conversation about our faith with a complete stranger? And this young evangelical did. And I was so impressed when any supervisor came right over and said, you're on the wrong side of the <laughs> <laughs> But he's on the right side of the gospel. <laughs> we... Um, we have to be prepared to share our faith. And we have, there's so many ways in which we can do that. Uh, sometimes we, we take for granted that people don't want to talk about important things. Uh, I was on a pilgrimage, this was years ago, I was on a pilgrimage and as we got on the bus uh, to take us from the one site back to our hotel. This is the conversation I heard between the two men in the seat directly behind me. Uh, the one was saying to the other, because we had just had mass and had a wonderful experience, and as we walked back, everybody was talking about this. 
The one said to the other, we have played golf together for 25 years. This is the first time we've ever talked about anything important. <laughs> and I thought, yes, we're so reluctant, even with friends, to talk about the important things. This is one of the things I, I find so refreshing about so many of our young people today. They're much more open to talking about really important things, including the place of the Lord in their lives. So when we talk about these elements of the new evangelization, this came through very, very clearly in the Synod, that we're talking about deepening our faith, we're talking about having confidence in our faith, and we're talking about sharing our faith. Why, why a new evangelization now? Why would the Pope call for a synod on the new evangelization. Why now? We've been at this for 2,000 years. Why all of a sudden? And this is, this is a very significant moment because our Holy Father has said he sees his <coughs> prophetic ministry as successor to Peter, as supreme pontiff in the church, recalling people to the new evangelization. That's saying a lot. The new evangelization is the church's response to what has happened across the world in the past 20, 25, 30 years. It's this secularism that is basically washed across the face of the Western world. In the opening talk that I had to give at the opening of the Synod to try to present what exactly are the parameters of our discussion? What are the elements that should be a part of our discussion? All this grew out of all the material that the conferences of bishops had sent in. I, I said that the secularism that has washed across Western culture is like a tsunami. It just, with such force, swept away all those things that we simply took for granted as part of the fabric of our culture, part of the fabric of our society. Marriage, family, common good, objective right and wrong, natural law, a moral order, all of those things were just presumed because they're true but they were just presumed to be a part of the fabric of the culture we all lived in. And the secular culture of the past 20 years has washed most of that away. We can't even determine, sadly enough, the definition of something as simple as marriage. That goes all the way back to Genesis. We can't, as a culture, even determine any longer what it means to say male and female, he created them. In the beginning, he created them. In his own image and likeness, he created them and said, come together. It's not good to be alone. Increase and multiply and fill the earth. We've lost the sense of family that one would be responsible for the children you generate, that one would be responsible to care and nurture and love and educate. The idea that there's a right and a wrong, not, well, that's your truth and this is mine, and besides, more of us voted for my truth, so we're right. A common good that we would all be expected to contribute something to a to something larger than ourselves, that there is a moral <laughs> order that grows out of who we are. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. All of that washed away in this wave of, of secularism. And this is what our Holy Father said when he visited us four years ago. The barriers to passing on the Catholic faith, the barriers to passing on the encounter with the Lord Jesus, the barriers to sharing the risen Lord are three. The secularism that's prevalent, 
predominant, in fact, it's the dominant culture right now, materialism, the horizon of vision is so limited, it doesn't move beyond the things that one has to see the wonder of all the things that we could have. One of the things that struck me, it's a beautiful, beautiful <coughs> sentence. We were talking about the materialism and the lack of transcendence and the lack of the sense in our culture of being connected to something bigger than ourselves. And one of the African bishops at the Synod said, that may be true in your culture, but in mine, transcendence is only a dream away. And I thought, how beautiful. Transcendence, touching beyond ourselves, touching God is only a dream away. What he was saying was, Every time you go to sleep, you're already, you're already in another realm. It's only a dream away. But this is something we, we tend to ignore. Uh, this is a sad sign of it. Uh, a couple months ago, I heard on the radio, uh, a woman was, was killed in a tragic auto accident. And they were speaking to her daughter, who was in her early 30s. And her daughter said, you know, it was so tragic and so unexpected uh, to lose my mother. And it made me think, it made me think how quickly your life could be taken from you. And I, I thought, well, this is, and she said, so I decided all those things I want to have, I'm going to get now. <laughs> but if your horizon is only there at that material level no wonder the gospel doesn't make sense and the third element that our Holy Father spoke about the secularism, the materialism and, indi and the individualism we tend, we tend as a culture to be very focused on ourselves why then a new evangelization because somehow Somehow we are going to have to start all over again with that simple, basic announcement. I passed on to you what I also received. Jesus Christ died, rose, was seen, went to the Father, and sent us the Spirit. It's that simple. The Holy Father said in this year of faith, just concentrate on the creed. Just come to appreciate and love the creed. It's all there. It's all there. We believe in God, the Father the Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, His Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The presence of Christ in the world today. His word, His sacraments, His body, His blood, the gift of His Spirit. All of that, all of that is what we're talking about. Who then, who's involved Who's involved in the new evangelization? If we've understood the reason we're having a new evangelization is because of the situation we're in, that there is a new Pentecost, that the Spirit is being poured out in the church in a new and fresh and I think very vibrant manner today. Who's involved in passing on that Spirit? Who is, who is caught up in the task of the new evangelization? And the answer is everyone. Everyone. Every one of us. But it begins in families. It begins in families. The task of telling the story of Jesus and passing it on begins in every family. The church begins all over every time a baby is baptized. Every time you watch, and I, and I always found this so beautiful with my nieces and nephews and now their children great nieces and nephews, watching them make the sign of the cross. Uh, when, we, when we come together, I always start by saying, can you do this in the name? Yes, in the name of the Father and of the Son. Somebody has to begin that process. And in families, that's, that's the start of this wonderful experience 
of passing on the good news, of inviting you to God's family. But it also, it also takes place at a second level in parishes. There was a resounding, echoing parish, 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 parish life, parish engagement, parish involvement in that city. Where do we come to encounter the Lord Jesus sacramentally? Where do we hear his word proclaimed? Where do we hear the explanation of that word spoken in the continuity of the church? For the most part, it's in our parishes. Wherever those parishes are, Africa, Asia, Oceania, Europe, South America, North America, bishops from all over the world were saying, when we're putting those propositions together, make sure you get parishes right up front. And it's the renewal of parish life that's going to be the renewal of church, the renewal of church in our country. Young people have a particular role in this. And I say this because we're experiencing in so many young people today an openness to the fact that Christ does have the answers. You look around and you see what's being proposed as how one would live and be happy, and you say, as so many young people are saying, there has to be more than this. This can't be all there is. There has to be something of substance, of value. There has to be something of beauty and wonder. There has to be something of transcendence. Yes, it's Jesus Christ risen and with us. How does this take place? How does the new evangelization work? The Pope in his opening remarks, this Holy Father is incredibly wonderful. He can, he can sit down and with a three by five card in front of him, give an incredible talk. He does it all the time. I've seen him do that in synod and meeting after meeting. He sat down at the beginning of our opening session of the synod. They have a, we have a prayer. You, you probably know the official language of the synod is Latin, uh, which is a uh, interesting uh, uh, approach to uh, carrying on dialogue for the new evangelization. <laughs> but, so at the beginning, we, we start with prayer, and we start with the, the uh, prayer of the hour. And they have a small, there's a small reading. They bring out two candles in this beautiful uh, book. And the presiding, there's a, a delegate, one of the three cardinals that are, uh, that take turns presiding that day. The Pope presides over the whole thing, but they're the ones that call on you when the church turns to speak. And one of them reads it. And uh, when we were all done the prayer, the Holy Father said, I'd like just to say a few words about that reading. And the reading consisted of just a few lines, and he said, and about the hymn we just sang. And then he went on to weave this beautiful explanation of what, in fact, is the new evangelization. And he said it begins. It begins with our personal conversion to the Word of God and the content of that Word. And then he kept returning to that theme. There's content to the Word of God. The revelation is not just an emotive moment. It's the Word made flesh. It has content. It speaks. It has words. And those words are the words of everlasting life. And then the second part is bearing witness to those words. Bearing witness to those words in our lives, in our actions, and when necessary, in our words. Again, the, 
the importance of being confident in the words so that we can live them out in our lives. He went on to tell us also, and this became one of the propositions in the Synod, the home, the home of the word is the church. And the home of the new evangelization is the church. It's here in the church that we can claim living continuity with Jesus Christ through our continuity with the apostles who saw him die, saw him alive, and saw him ascend in glory. It was to them Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. And so when, when we look at where do I find all this? Where do I find this encounter with Jesus Christ? Where do I meet him today? Where do I come to know, hear his word, and come to know him in his body and blood? Where? It's his church. Uh, on a, um, another flight. <laughs> As I got into my seat, the, and this was one of those embryos, so you were pretty crowded. The woman in the window, she turned to me and she said, when were you born again? And I said, in baptism. And she said, oh, you're Catholic. <laughs> and we started to talk. And she said to me, you're Catholic, so you're big into this church thing. <laughs> so, yes. And, and she said, tell me about it. So I said, I will. <laughs> Why don't we start with Matthew? You're Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. And we had a wonderful conversation uh, because she she had a number of scriptural uh, passages she was very comfortable with. And, and love. But she really had very, very little experience of church and what it means to be part of God's family, what it means to be a part of the body of Christ, what it means to be a member of the family of God. Anyway, we had a very nice conversation. And uh, as we landed, the man on the aisle right across him leaned over and he said, Hey, Father, I'm Catholic, and I didn't know that. <laughs> we take, I think, sometimes for granted the church, our mother, the church, the home of the word, the church, the place of the new evangelization. So when asked, where does all this take place? It takes place everywhere. But it takes place in families, it takes place in homes, it takes place in school, but all of this has to be connected to the body of Christ, it has to be a part of his church. I want to conclude with one of the, one of the elements that greatly impressed me in the Synod. The sense that this is a new moment. It's a new moment in the life of the church. There is something happening. All you have to do is look at the large number of young adults, young people, college age people, who are in fact asking the real questions. I had a, a visit on Saturday morning at our seminary with one group of, of young men <coughs> thinking about exploring, asking questions about priesthood. And last evening at St. Peter's, Hill, we had another group, about 25 of them, uh, just exploring what's this, what's priesthood all about? What, what does it mean? Uh, there are an awful lot of young people today who are saying, this is a different moment, this is a new moment. For all of us, what makes the new evangelization so important is it's our moment. It's our moment now. In 2,000 years, the church has faced all kinds of situations, all kinds of historical developments, all kinds of moments. And it's faced those moments 
in its own way. What makes this so unique is it's our turn. It's our turn right now to do the very best we can to share in this outpouring of the Spirit, this new Pentecost, and to see that others get invited into the message. The parallels between the very early church and our day, I think, are extremely strong. The parallels between the first disciples going out, you will be my witnesses, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, go, go. And they went out and there was a whole world they met who had no, no inkling of the wonder of the gospel, of the wonder of the risen Lord. We're not that different today. The only difference is the people we're going out to talk to are people who think they already know, and it has no meaning. They're the people who we have to once again inspire with our faith, our witness, our lives, that this great message, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, is really true. Thank you. for what you're doing. One of the things we talked about, one of the, and, and this is not just in the Senate, we talked about this in our own conference of bishops. Communications is the, the thing today. You can have this wonderful message, you can have this great gospel story, but if you can't get it out, and today electronic media is where so many, almost all of the young people are, huh? into that whole world of electronic media. We have to find ways of reaching them, speaking to them in, in their language, uh, which is today sound bites. Uh, and so I, I congratulate you. Uh, I don't have any, um, any practical uh, uh, suggestion to make, but I congratulate you and anybody like yourself who is saying, this is how we have to tell the story, maybe because it's true. Yes, it strikes me that the lack of confidence the church has is due in large measure to um, a 500 euro plus propaganda campaign by sector forces and 
Protestantism. It really made the church's history out to be something to be ashamed of. Um, I think there needs to be a, a major effort, not only in catechization, but really in, in education, getting the, the truth out about the history of the church, that we don't have as much to be ashamed of and apologetic about as uh, people would have us be. Is there, is there a thought about that? Well, yeah, I think you're, you're, your insight is a very, very real one. Uh, I'm not sure how you tell the story. Again, we're back now to uh, how, how do we get today our, our story out. Uh, there's the official Kennedy director, the official Catholic director, mm -hmm. so, that thing. Uh, <coughs> open that up. Page after page after page of parish, school, hospital, social service, Catholic charities, throughout this country, uh, all of that beautiful, beautiful testimony to the truth of the gospel and the love of Christ church, the love of God, <coughs> our neighbor, back yesterday's gospel, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your energy, and love your neighbor as yourself. But you're not gonna, you're not gonna pick up a local newspaper and read any of that, nor are you gonna turn on your television and see any of that. I'm not sure what we do about that, except continue to do what we do as, as church. And, uh, and try as, as best we can to tell the story. And maybe the younger people coming along with the electronic media, with all the social communications, will be able to do that better than we have. Yes? Now, one insight that I had in, um, in reading some of the um, some of the information that came out in the Synod, though, and while I think the electronic media is good, conversion still happens one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that was very clear to me as I was reading that, that while we can have all of this good information out there, if there isn't someone who, I mean, I mean that's maybe how the spirit works. It, it's sort of one-on-one -on -one that someone says something that may not even be the, the, um, theological or, or churchy, but that, that just, with their life. So I do think that while electronic media is great, you still have to have people there one-on-one -on -one talking to people. Absolutely. And that's how it all began. That's how it all began. You have the words of everlasting life. Where would I go? It all begins. And, but we were talking about electronic media to be able to reach people with any part of the story so that they might be interested in saying to someone, what's that all about? Yes. Just a, a comment and a question. I think my experience for my generation and younger is both our families and our friends are, are not just Catholic. You know, our, our families have siblings that marry Protestants or not Protestants. Um, and respect kind of devolves into um, just accepting anything and not wanting to offend anyone. So my question is, like, as the church really stands up and makes this truth claim that this is a community that you can really trust, do you see the message reaching or engaging not just uh, non-practicing Catholics, but really all the Protestant denominations, just by the nature of what we're standing up and saying. The truth is, is great. And a quiet testimony to the truth. Think of St. Francis of Assisi. All those 700 years ago, and his impact, that quiet witness of his, continues to touch me. Mother Teresa, that quiet impact continues to touch people. I think, yes, as we, as we bear witness confidently, we don't have to offend anybody but we simply do have to say what is true. Uh, that confidence, that quiet, 
witness and testimony, I think touches people, touches hearts. Uh, in the beginning, when when we had so many martyrs at the beginning of the of the life of the church, uh, it was that witness that touched so so many people. So I. It's it's a challenge. It's a challenge today because we have, we're in a very pluralistic society, but I believe we always were. It just wasn't quite as uh, as pronounced as it is today. Yes, sir. Question for you, Matty. Um, I didn't hear any discussion on uh, the new evangelization, new evangelization, occurring through the home, and I asked that question as an evangelical who saw something here tonight by numerous people that I've never seen before in mass, and that was folks taking notes with, about what you were saying. And it just my own experience in attending mass with my wife, who is Catholic, is there's not much to write down after listening to their article. <laughs> and, you know, if you have a visitor coming to church, it's the mass that they're coming to. And I understand the focus of the mass is, is different than what Protestant gatherings are. But, you know, if you have a Protestant attending or a non-believer attending, communion is not for them to participate in at that time. And so your method of reaching them is through the home. And so I'm curious if there's anything that's going to be done in that manner. That's, a, that's an excellent observation. And it's an observation that was made over and over and over again on the Synod, on the Word. And I want to just get back to that. Um, you're right. We go to Mass for something other than the homily. We go to Mass because this is our moment in the Eucharist to participate in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And to do that in a way that I actually enter and benefit. But the Liturgy of the Word is supposed to communicate to us, and the homily is an integral part of the Liturgy of the Word. So we have the readings, and then there's supposed to be um, a homily that will bring out of that Word that we just listened to something that will nurture us. It's a very challenging task. The Synod on the Word of God that was held three years ago said the biggest problem is the homily. How do you get good homilies? And how do you get all the things you want into the homily? And this is where it becomes more and more difficult. You want, I always argue for a homily that has content. Say something that the person in front of you can take with them because this may be the only place they're going to hear about their Catholic faith. But there are others legitimately saying, no, you're supposed to inspire them and touch their heart. So it doesn't have to focus necessarily on the content, but it can, what you want to do is stir their, touch their soul. And then you have the liturgists who say, Look, you have the readings, and there's a theme, and you have to develop that theme. So you have all these currents uh, going on. Uh, well, I sympathize with what you're saying. You should come away from the homily with something. Uh, we as a conference of bishops are working on a document. Uh, not that documents do all that much. But we're working on a document on good preaching, trying to encourage all of us to, uh, to do a better job in preaching. This brings us back to something that, uh, again, modern communications. We're told now, every time, every time we do one of these studies on preaching, we're told the time you have is shorter and shorter. <laughs> because attention spans are shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, we're told, learn to talk in sound bites. They say to me, 
you go on and on. <laughs> you have a, a major, a minor, and a conclusion. Who cares? <laughs> but that's the way some of us think. It's, it's just very, very difficult to accomplish what, what you are reminding us should be our goal. Well, if I, if I may, if everything that you just concluded with is correct, except for the case of the person who is seeking. They're <coughs> there to hear. They don't have a short attention span. They're looking for something. And when you talk, you have their attention. And, you know, again, it just... I, and that's, a, again, that's all... The, not every, not everyone in the congregation is a seeker, but you would like to be able to touch the seeker. But then you have this whole array of people, all of whom come with different needs. But I, I do appreciate and I do sympathize with you. Chairman, I'd like to pick up on the question before this, which is in that sort of family situation, where someone has married outside the church or has otherwise left the church. What is it that makes us shy, as you put it, in that sort of situation, and how do you surpass that? Well, I, I think we always, one of the reasons we, we tend to be a little bit reluctant is, I think we confuse um, not addressing an issue with speaking in love. You can always speak and not of them. But I think we, we tend to think if I raise this issue, it's going to be offensive. I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, we talk about all kinds of things. I, I, I marvel at how young people are talking about all kinds of things. And it doesn't seem to bother anybody. But when we come to uh, something that's important and our relationship to God. I think we just we have to be able to speak the truth in love. One final question uh, before we I'll let this stand back there. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's a, it's a real honor to have you addressing us tonight, uh, especially on such an occasion. The kind of as a follow up uh, to this question about homilies, we hear a lot about living the faith and living it richly in this new evangelization. And one of the things I noticed, well, just as running a business, actually, I'll, I'll reference. You, whenever you have a meeting and there's no follow-ups, there's nothing to do, you know that you wasted the last hour of your life. <laughs> and, and I think we've all had that experience with committee meetings where you can leave and there's no one does anything. And it was great that you talked, but talking really rarely does much. So I guess the question I have is, why don't homilies more often have an action item? Like, why don't I walk away going, I love confession for that. I mean, it's, it's fantastic where it's like, okay, this is what I've got to go do. And it would be fantastic if I walked out of Mass on a regular basis going, okay, I've got to go to, like, bring, another, bring another person to Mass, which I actually thought of this because you're, you're addressed, I think, at the CIC dinner when you talked about um, the, the priest at, at uh, George Washington University who like, commanded his, his flock to go bring more people to Mass, and they did. I think this is a fantastic idea. I'd love to see more. <coughs> so would I. <laughs> but again, we what we're asking people to go out and do sometimes might be much more subtle. Uh, it's one thing to say, go and bring somebody back to church. It's another thing to say, look into your heart and see how much this week you have spoken to God. There are lots of, uh, lots of ways of doing it, but you're right. It would be wonderful if every time we went to Mass and heard a homily, we came out of there and said, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, well, I'll keep working on my homilies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Your Eminence, and uh, as you depart, we'd like to give a farewell. I want to ask everyone to keep you in the prayers as you prepare for the upcoming meeting of the bishops this coming week and for your birthday uh, this coming, uh, just a week from today. 
So we'll be praying for you as you're celebrating your birthday with your brother bishops. Thank you so much for being with us. Good night.